Hey guys, and welcome back to Conversations with Asper and Vedant. Um, so today we'll talk about how we approached our chest rotations in our first year of residency, all right? So chest was my very first rotation as a radiology resident. So describing myself as clueless is truly an understatement. Not only did I, know, did I not know how the PAC system worked, I don't know where the closest bathroom was. <laughs> and I, I remember kind of going from the first floor to the ground floor because that was the only bathroom I knew. There's a bathroom like next to the reading room in like a locker room. I did not figure out any of those, right? And, and that's and so the best we, bathroom. That, that, and that's <laughs> the best bathroom, exactly, because it's super private and super secret, all right? So in terms of how I approached my chest rotation, I think it will be very different to someone like you, Vedan, who's – First rotation was not chest, right? Yeah. So I walk in, first year resident, I was told to mostly focus on chest x-rays, you know? And of course, it opened up an inpatient chest film. It's an ICU chest film. All the lines and tubes you can ever imagine on planet Earth. I think I saw more lines and tubes than I saw loose and long. <laughs> that's, <laughs> and that's pretty accurate. That's, pretty, that's actually pretty accurate, right? <laughs> And of course, it took me 20, 30 minutes to uh, yeah. 20 minutes is an understatement. 30 minutes to describe what should take someone about t- no more than 10, 10 minutes is a stretch, no more than like seven minutes on call, right? So chest x-rays are there some of the, most of the chest x-rays. I was told to pick up the ED chest x-rays, which turned out to be a little easier. Um, and towards the end of my first rotation, I really end up my first rotation. They told me to start picking up chest CTs. Hmm. Um, and of course, start with the ED chest CTs and then slowly progress to like the outpatient cancer follow up and stuff. How did your chest rotation go? Yeah. So, like you said, I kind of had it a little bit later in the year. So, it was probably November. So, four months in. And at that yeah. point, I think I started to get my bearings. Um, and what was nice, two things that were nice. One was I had already had like CT body. Um, so in terms of just like going through a cross sectional, like the basics and sagittal coronal and like all just like how you're laying out all your, all your images was what's much easier. Um, the second thing was, you know, I was on nuclear medicine the month before. And so, you know, the last week, you know, because bone scans take a little bit of time to, to get ready, you know, I was studying for chest like a week before actually you know, starting the rotation. So, you know, I think I spent maybe the first three days on chest x-rays exclusively. And then they were like, all right, you want to like pick up a CT, right? And so um, it was definitely like a little bit different um, from my end on that. Um, you know, I think like one thing that really stuck out to me was I didn't realize, you know, the the type of studies, like even the type of chest x-rays or the type of CTs, Um until I did the rotation. So you kind of alluded, you know, chest x-rays, you have your ICU, like there's even ICU, there's post-op ICU, like immediately post-op where you're kind of responsible for like listing out where everything is very explicitly. because it's the first time those things have been imaged. Um, and then there's like the ICU follow-up where like sometimes it's like their 50th chest x-ray in two weeks. And oftentimes, you know, it's like, you know, overall lines tube stable, everything looks stable you know, you comment on an impression. You obviously have inpatient, which is a lot more varied. And then the emergency x-rays, like I know you said, you know, they're like the easiest. And I think, yeah, like from a, are the things that you're commenting on definitely like there's typically less things there, especially if it's totally negative, but it's also, you know, personally, I've heard attendings also say like, those are honestly the most stressful because if it's a negative chest x-ray, maybe their entire workup's negative. And they get discharged and then comes back later on and you miss something because it wasn't, you know, something that was consp- like easily seen there that, you know, they'll, they'll look back and scrutinize that chest x-ray. So a lot of attendings, I know that they'll, they'll say, I actually spend a little bit more time on those ED ones that I'm about to call completely normal just to make sure that it truly is. Hmm, interesting. And in terms of uh, chest CTs, which I yeah, presume you started earlier. Yeah. Uh, in your rotation, what sort of yep. studies did you come across? Yeah. So even there, I don't know about you, man, but like before I started radiology, I didn't know when to give contrast or not. It felt like, like 
I don't know, like magic. Cause like you'd put in an order and I'd always go without, with and without contrast every time. And then yeah. like when you're actually looking at the study, you're not actually seeing like, Oh, did they change the order and like all that stuff? But clearly radiologists are doing it on the back end to like make it the right thing. And so, you know, for chest, there's like question is, you know, should you give contrast? And then what's the timing of like when you're imaging and unlike body, chest like see you can get a, like a pretty decent evaluation of most structures on like the chest without contrast right because you already have a natural contrast between pleura lung lung bone and then also like the soft tissues um where iv contrast becomes super helpful is within the soft tissues if you want to look at anything right like you, you've probably seen it like if you don't have contrast you can't tell the difference between like a heart chamber or a lymph node um or even esophagus depending on where it is and so, like, that's where you give IV contrast and things become very, very clear to understand. Um, and then finally, you know, the, you know, that contrast, you know, I'd have to look at exactly what the specific timing of the bolus is, but it's not necessarily a CTA, right? And specifically, you know, wh when you're getting a CTA for the chest, you're really primarily looking for pulmonary artery um, emboli right as like the most common thing and so that gets triggered at a different time when they're like looking through where the contrast is in the body um, and that's really going to give you the best pacification of all the arteries and, and really give you a chance to see if there is an embolus yeah so i think importantly so you mentioned we do we do uh, chest uh or ctp pa studies or ct pulmonary artery studies obviously from the origin setting um, and the, the timing of contrast or like whether it's with contrast or without contrast. I think in residency, I always used to think, oh, if you want the fullest details, you should yeah. always do a without and a with contrast. Yeah. Uh, but it cannot be further from the truth, right? Rarely yeah. do you need with and without. And when you do with and without, not in the chest actually, but in like if in the abdomen and pelvis, you're usually trying to image like the adrenals or the pancreas, you have a specific protocol for that. Yeah. And even then, you sometimes you get delays, like like you know you're doing CT urograms, right? But again, that's off topic. Yeah. Um, in terms of others, I think chest studies. Uh, one of the things that that I became pretty good at is picking up the ED, ED uh, chest CTs because I think some of the uh, outpatient ones uh, could be just straight up cancer follow up yeah. um, or yeah. other chronic like lung diseases. That had, that you know, th that could be less prioritized than like the ED cases that we would, could see on call. Not that yeah. they're not important to learn; they're important to learn. But you know, everything has a priority, and it's uh, for me. I thought it was more important to learn how to scrutinize a pulmonary embolism better than like kind of scrutinizing what type of uh, interstitial lung disease a patient has. Yeah, right. So I think you bring up a good point that I didn't realize when I started residency which is outpatient scans are typically harder, <laughs> right? And I think the reason is, you, know, you think about it is, who's ordering imaging as an outpatient? It's typically at some end point in care, right? So it's either like the oncologist, so it's not like a primary care physician, oftentimes it's the oncologist, or a pulmonologist, like you said, in a patient with severe interstitial lung disease. And so those patients are going to have like all this pathology when you open it up. And so yeah. you're starting out and you're like, I kind of just wanted to figure out what pulmonary edema look like. And then like the attending's like, well, it's a little bit here and they have like superimposed interstitial lung disease and emphysema. And you're just like, yeah, this was not helpful for me to build my concept. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of like that across the board in, in radiology where outpatients oftentimes are more complex unless you found the outpatient scans ordered from a primary care physician. And, you know, that's not necessarily something that is explicitly at least filtered in, in our system. But yeah, yeah. I think if you can start recognizing the ordering provider, you can get, get like a pseudo, you know, filtering <laughs> process. And because sometimes right. you're just like, okay, I'll just, and, and, but that's honestly how like, even like other clinical practices, they'd be like, I'm a primary care physician. Here are the, mm -hmm. the scope of practices. And because it all just gets lumped into one single like work list, I think there is a little bit more differentiation that we all probably kind of intuitively know. Um, yeah, what was I, a surprise for me? Definitely. I think and, and this is this is something that we start picking up more and more as you progress through the year, right? Obviously, when I started out, I had no such intuition. Hence, I was just 
using those generalities, like pick the ED study, pick the inpatient study, don't pick the outpatient study, right? Yeah. But again, as you said, a kind of scrutinizing the ordering provider could help us su- at least pseudo differentiate, you know? Yeah. Now, chest was my first rotation. It was not yeah. your first rotation. Yeah. First, I'll go over what I used to study for chest because when I'm starting out, I had no studying style. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so when I was going through my chest rotation, I was sort of figuring out my style. So a lot of the stuff that I did isn't necessarily what I stuck with in the long run as I progressed through my first year of radiology residency. Right. So I actually tried everything out. I tried out books. I read uh, Felsen's chest radiology. I think principles of chest rheumatology. Uh, And I also read Fundamentals of High Resolution CT, which was recommended by all the faculty. And I really, really like that book. The first five chapters, I think, is something that everyone should read when they're starting to read chest CTs, right? But beyond that, I also, this is where I also realized that I like learning from videos, especially YouTube videos. One of our uh, course leaders, Dr. Scott Simpson, he has his own YouTube channel where he uploads really, really good um, lectures on some fundamental uh, chest uh, x-ray and CT topics. I watched all of those. There's this another uh, attending, Dr. Rishi Agarwal at Northwestern. He's a cardiothoracic radiologist. I watched most of his videos. Again, they're also very focused on chest topics. Um, and a smattering of other videos on like uh, specific chest CT topics that I found yeah. online and I actually added to the Google, my Google document that I watched. Um, I also did RAD Primer. You know, we get all of us get access to RAD Primer through uh, through our residency program. This is when I realized I'm not a big fan, especially mm. RAD Primer for cross-sectional imaging. Yeah. The reason being, they'll have all these static images, and you have to click through to look at them. Sometimes it's a stack of like ten images, and it's just yeah. it was very very annoying to go through them. Now. For x-rays, it was fantastic, right? Or for like one-off images, they're fantastic. Which is why, again, you know, in, in our other like Gen Nukes feed, I recommended that for general Nukes because there's not a lot of images to scroll through. Yeah. And so I didn't really like Red Primer. This is when I kind of stopped doing Red Primer for the rest of my rotations that had cross-sectional imaging, right? So those are the three things I tried. I tried Red Primer, so Question Bank, I didn't like that. I tried YouTube videos. I loved it. And also try and also read the two textbooks, Feltzer's Chest Radiology, which I read in my first week, and then throughout the rest of the rotation, I read Fundamentals of High Resolution CT, and I paid close attention to the first five chapters. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's funny that like you know you don't like those questions, and I think you're right. Mm-hmm. You know, I would you know otherwise I'd like Rad Primer, but you're 100 percent right. The the cross sectional component to it is really lacking, um, and so. Um, I just power through it because I'm like, you know, that's that's what I like to do. So, you know, I actually like chess was probably the first time that, like I said, I figured out what I wanted to study or how I wanted to do it. And I was like, let me just see if I finish, you know, that curriculum that I set for myself, how I feel at the end of that month. Um, so, you know, that week before I just did those beginner rad primer questions. And, you, you know, especially for like the chest x-ray stuff, like it's really got some very basic like anatomy and like how many lobes and, you know, what's the the segments and all that stuff. And then even like the basic kind of x-ray signs, it's really, really nicely laid out. Um, continue to just do all of those as well, um, even with the cross-sectional imaging that they have. Um, I then read uh, Felsen's like chest x-ray book. And, you know, it's funny that you say it's like, probably like the one book you've ever read, right? Because you just went to videos right <laughs> after it. Cause I think that first it is, page, right? <laughs> well, like say during residency, um, yeah. I think it is one of the worst books I have ever read. <laughs> it like, it, it is not organized. It like, I was just not a fan at all. And so I was like, like everyone keeps recommending this. And I was like very unhappy. Um, then like reading high res CT, like was the complete opposite experience. It is one of the most organized books. And specifically, it's like the first five chapters goes over the patterns of chest like imaging, right? And I think what's what feels different, at least as like, you know, an R2 at this point, is that chest is the most like describing art. Because like you're looking at the lungs as an entire like like organ and it takes up a good 
you know, chunk of real estate. So you're not like scrutinizing specific, like small segments or small parts of anatomy, like in other modalities, but you're like, let me look at the lung and all the different, like, you know, um, you know, sagittal, coronal, axial, and what's the overall picture and how does that correlate with the clinical symptoms? And then what I would say this patient has, right. And so the first five chapters kind of exclusively go into, you know, how things present. And then like the last, whatever, 10 chapters, goes over like clinically, if you're thinking interstitial lung disease, what's your algorithm? But it all ends up kind of incorporating the same imaging patterns, but in that specific like clinical situation. So it's a lot of repetition, I would say in the latter half of the book. And so they both kind of complement each other, but that first five chapters was like outstanding. Um, so ultimately once I did that, I went to core radiology um, and, you know, I like making flashcards. And so, you know, went through the book and you know what was nice about chess is there's not much mr and so most of the content in core radiology was very relevant for me um and so i made i guess i'm looking at it right now like 350 flashcards um all kind of ranging from again just basic anatomy questions and chess x-ray stuff to like you know what's your differential if you're seeing this imaging pattern Right. And so, you know, now being like a year later, like going through this and I'm doing practice cases um, in preparation for call, I'm like, oh, I've already created this. I need to review this. And so definitely I think it's going to speed up, you know, my my re-understanding. Um, but, uh, you know, that was pretty much what I did. And that, you know, took me a month to, to complete. Nice, nice, nice. I think speaking of call. Right. Yeah. Uh, the way we both of us sort of approach and we're encouraged to approach our entire first year is to get ready for call, overnight call, daytime, weekend call shifts that we take uh, throughout our second year, you know, but that where we read all kinds of studies. Right. Yeah. Is there anything that you would have done differently uh, on your first score round now that you have the experience yeah. of your entire first year? Yeah, I would not have read Felsen's. <laughs> like categorically would not have read it. I would have probably used the resources you um, laid out because I think especially for chest x-ray, there are so many high quality online videos, right? And like I watch Scott's, you know, Scott Simpson's videos as well. Um, and, you know, but not just his, but chess x-rays are just like, there's so much like out there. And like, even there's a website that like shows you all the lines and tubes, like everything's so interactive and really just high quality stuff. So I would have said, I'm just going to learn chess x-rays from that. Um, the other thing, and you know, we've been talking about this a lot is I'm now in love with case stacks, right? Like we, we, you know, we got access kind of halfway through our, our one year and it's really billed as like, you know, call preparation. But now that I'm doing it for call preparation, I'm like, why didn't I have this then? Right. So both for plain films and like chest x-rays, you know, there's what, like at least a hundred or 150 just chest x-rays that you can go through and then, you know, you know, go through all the different like, you know, images that they have in that stack, look at like the findings and see, is it correlating with your impression? Right. To me, that is like as similar as it can be. And it mimics you world in the sense of like, you do your part and then you see what your concept was and compare it to a highly labeled ground truth. Nothing better. And then even for cross-sectional, what's like really nice about it is again, there's trauma cases, there's non-trauma cases, and then there's like a mixed bag review case, right? So I guess I'm currently on the non-trauma cases and I already did the trauma cases, but like the non-trauma cases, man, like it's like one case will just be diffuse pulmonary edema in, and being like, you have to re on a CT and be like, recognize the dependent um, ground class opacities, recognize the cardiomegaly. And like, again, building your imaging pattern and in a very kind of focused set, because Oftentimes, clinically, you may see the most complex pulmonary edema in this post-op cabbage patient. And like you miss the forest for the trees of like, what's that specific one-to-one -one correlation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think kind of going beyond that, um, the reason why case tests, I loved case tests, especially for my first year, is we often have trouble describing things. We just don't have the vocabulary, right? Yeah. Well, the nice thing that case text does, it gives you the, exactly the finding section and an impression section. And they have an additional discussion section where you get the teaching points across. So what I was doing is I was actually making throughout my first year, later half of my first year, when I had a second go at most of my rotations, I was actually, I actually started making flashcards. You know, here I am, you know, starting off my chest rotation, didn't even consider flashcards. I was making flashcards 
not just of the pathology that is presented on that specific case, but also what words they use to describe yeah. those findings. And oftentimes, these uh, patients or damages would have other incidental findings that would yeah. be elegantly pointed out in those cases. So again, it's like uh, you get a real case, you have yep. your relevant finding, you have important incidentals, and you two kind of get across as well. And of yeah. course, in a discussion, you know, they kind of bring it all home with like a general concept that we should know. And so I've been making flashcards and to get ready for a call, you know, which was, you know, which I did a little bit in the beginning of my first chest rotation. But on my second chest rotation, which was towards the end of my first year, I really ramped this up. And I was primarily using case flashcards that I made from case stacks to study for the rotation. Yeah. And, and did you like it? Like doing this I did. hundred percent, hundred percent. Because yeah. as you said, this this is as close as it gets to real call experience. Yeah. Now, yeah. some of the cases can be very, they're very unidim- unidimensional in the sense that there's one predominant diagnosis staring at you. Like you know, yeah. uh, whereas on call you may have like two or like a super complicated case coming. There will be like multiple diagnoses, right? Yeah. So it's great, great. It's great for learning. But I feel like, you know, I need definitely need to see more complicated. Yeah, patients. 100%. And I think for that, what I'm going to do, uh, I did a very a little bit of it in, in my chest rotation. I just reviewed the, the, the cases that my attending read um, yeah. so throughout throughout the day. And, I, you know, we'd have, we'd get a home workstation. I'd come home, yeah. just open it up, just, just look at the impression, see if it sounds yeah. interesting, right? <laughs> and then open, open up the case and then try to – take a look at it. Now, I wasn't quizzing myself. I wasn't going through yeah. it first and yeah. then trying to look at the impression because I feel like that would have overwhelmed my brain, especially yeah. after a work day. But yeah. I feel like something low stress like that, where I'm trying to increase my exposure, I thought was a good idea, especially yeah. in the sense that we are looking at real life cases that came through our hospital. Yeah. So I haven't done that specifically yet. I'm planning on doing it in about three weeks, kind of like two weeks before I start call. But what I was, what my plan is after I do all these case stack stuff for especially neuro, seat, uh, chest, and and body, all the seat, all the cross sectionals, is go back and find whoever was on nights and like read their cases from like two or three days prior. So I know like that is what we see on nights, and then like we already have an attending like impression that we can see, and like you know I think. The reason I think that might be better than what you're doing is your version includes all this outpatient stuff that we just talked about that like right. yeah. possibly yeah. outside of scope. This method is exactly what like five days later I'm going to be doing. Yeah. Right. So um, I, I, you know, I like that's that's my plan going forward. And I think, you know, all these like power scribe or sec, like all these different pack systems, it's pretty easy to get that information and create, you know, your next tiered level, almost like case case stacks that you, you're, you're creating yourself. No. No, no, you mentioned that you're going to go back and look at the uh, cases that someone else encountered on call two to three days prior. Yeah. I know that you go on call right after I do. So are you going to look at my cases, oh, it's, bro? Oh, oh, dude, it's all your cases, all your, all your, uh, your errors. All I'll be better than you. I'll be better. I got to be better. You'll be like, I cannot believe you missed that. Yeah, like, yeah. out of the face. <laughs> Idiot. A two millimeter <laughs> nodule. Wow, dude. Yeah. You kill that patient who came Man. with a trauma, dude. <laughs> what an amateur, you know? <laughs> exactly. That was actually the reason. You you read my um, mind. So, yeah. Can't believe yeah. you didn't catch that adrenal adenoma. Yeah. <laughs> Lipid rich, you know, it doesn't really matter, but whoa, you know, who you knows? Didn't, you didn't measure the renal cyst. I that's, didn't that's the what's going to get you. Rookie mistake, man. Rookie Our, mistake. I measured all the renal cysts. <laughs> it's yeah. probably going to be me. <laughs> yeah. But so, I mean, you know, like, we'll we'll see what, what works. Um, I'm yeah, excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, but, but I think kind of bringing it back, that's what we're doing for our second year. But I feel like, you know, what you mentioned, some version of increasing one's exposure to real life cases is important. <laughs> especially towards the end of your first year, if you have another chest rotation. Obviously, when you're starting off chest, we're both building fundamentals. We're building anatomy. We're building, uh, looking at cases, uh, emergency ED cases. Uh, we, we're building our uh, vocabulary, right? Yeah. But on our second go around, we really need to build our pathology, our exposure yeah. to pathology, and especially 
which includes not just, you know, the things that patients come up, you know, the, all, all the pathological diseases, but also the, the different surgeries that patients yep. get, yep. right? Yep. I think that is super, super critical, learning this sur- post-surgical anatomy of stuff, yep. learning about post-surgical complications as well. Yep. Um, yeah, man. Hundred percent agree with you. Like, I guess my final point to that is, you know, we are now in the age that we are not tied to the number of studies that we read during the day for that to drive our training, because of packs and the availability for real world like training for yourself. You you know, in during the day, like you're saying, if you're spending ten minutes because you're like, I'm not sure what to say, when you do it asynchronously and you're looking through these images and seeing what the impression is. You can go through a lot more, see a lot more, and then not be like fearful of like, I don't want to say the wrong thing and then inconvenience my attending to have to change those things before they sign final sign stuff. So um, yeah. I agree with you. I think like that's the way for, for us to kind of go forward. Definitely. And I think it's also important. I feel like a theme in the first year, it's also important to know that, you know, you're learning, right? you're yeah. learning everything. Everything is new, right? So don't beat yourself up if you don't get the diagnosis, if you can't find words to describe yeah. things, right? Um, it's a struggle. And yeah. when you become a second year resident, you see brand new residents starting, you kind of see their struggle. You realize how much you've progressed. And I think when yeah. we're going through the process, it's and we're all going through it together as a yeah. class, it's yeah. very difficult to evaluate our progress, right? Because it is yeah. so gradual. And we're all progressing at the same, more or less on the same rate, right? And so, you know, you just got to keep hammering at it, most importantly, I think it's important to just keep learning. And chest is yeah. such a fundamental rotation. Chest yeah. x-rays is going to be with every single radiologist, right? Um, and you'll be yeah. either you'll be asked by your family, even if you're not a yeah. chest radiologist, you'll encounter yeah. it in some clinical context, no matter what subspecialist you are. Because at some point, I feel like everyone gets a chest x-ray, yeah. right? And so having good fundamentals is super important. And as you said, chest CTs, there's not, there's not a lot of... MR we do for the for, uh, MR thorax, right? Yeah. Uh, and so again, th- these are fundamental stuff, you know, cross-sectional CTs and chest x-rays that all first-year residents, I feel like, should get good at. Um, yep. And I think we both highlighted a few good resources and methods and approaches and advice that first-years can take to really make the best use of their chest rotations. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll just continue to reevaluate as we learn more as well. So absolutely, absolutely, man. All right. I, I All right. hope this was uh, helpful for our listeners. Uh, it was certainly helpful reflecting on what we both went through and kind of what we'd have done differently. Until next time, see you guys. Bye.